Okay, we are back. So if you're here, find your seat. And Steve, out in the lobby, you wanted to do this, so you need to come in. <laughs> Steve, we are ready to go. Okay, <laughs> that works. So, Steve wanted to continue this afterwards, so. So, uh, you call my name, I was paged. Thank you very much. So, let me ask you all to rise. If you're new with us, you'll want to pick up one of those laminated sheets in the pew. Uh, I call them the cheat sheets. I'm going to have to come up with a holier word. At least come up with what cheat sheet is in Hebrew. Looks like this. As we uh, chant Deuteronomy chapter 6 4 and the rest of the liturgy for and with the Shema, please join me. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem, Kivod Machuto, Leolam Vaed. And now join me in English. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Amen. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha Bechol levacha Ubechol nafshecha Ubechol meodecha Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha Bechol levacha Ubechol nafshecha and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And of course, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. You may turn around. And even though we've already dismissed our children, I still think we can pray for them, right? So let's, uh, let's uh, do the Sabbath prayer for our children. the Lord protect and defend the Lord you. protect and defend May you. He always shield you from shame. May he always shield you from shame. May you come to be in paradise a shining day. May you be like Ruth and like Strengthen them, O oh Lord, and keep them from the stranger's ways. May God bless you and grant you long life. May the Lord fulfill your Sabbath prayer for you. May God make you husbands and wives. May he cause your maids to always care for you. May the Lord protect and defend you. May the Lord preserve you from pain. Favor them, O Lord, with happiness and peace. Oh, hear our Sabbath can we have them sit down or are we going to make them stand right back up again <laughs> you may be seated it just seems to happen so often when I tell you to sit down, Michael tells you to stand up again, so I thought I'd get his permission this time. 
All right, we'll continue with the Haftorah service. Ya'amod Chava Bat Yisrael. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Halam Asher Bachar Bin Vim Tovim Veretzave Divrehem Ane Marim Be'emet Baruch Atah Adonai Habacher batora uv Moshe abdo uv Yisrael amo ubim biyeha emet bat sedech. Blessed is the Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has chosen faithful prophets to speak words of truth. Blessed is the Lord for the revelation of Torah for Moses' servant and Yisrael his people, and for the prophets of truth and righteousness. This morning's reading is a twofer. We read from Isaiah 1, verses 2 through 4, and Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 5. Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his master. The donkey is owner's manger. But Yisrael does not know. My people do not understand. O oh, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Isaiah 2. 1 through 5. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen. Al ha Torah, they all ha avodah, they all ha navim, they all yom ha shabbat hazeh, shenatata lanu adonai eloheinu, Liktushav limnucha lechavod ultifaret al hakol adonai eloheinu anaknu modim lach umavarachim otach yiparak shim kaba fi kochai tamid leolam vayed Baruch atah Adonai Mekadesh HaShabbat. For the Torah and for the privilege of worship, for the prophets and for this Shabbat that you, O Lord our God, have given us for holiness and rest, for honor and glory, we thank and bless you. May your name be blessed forever by every living being. Blessed is the Lord for the Shabbat and its holiness. Look, they're abandoning me. So uh, a couple weeks ago, I put together a special message for you 
uh, Jewish perspective of Christmas. I said, you know, Christmas should be a Jewish holiday. And uh, I shared that with Book of Life. And then I put a special message together for Book of Life on Christmas Eve. And I'm going to share a part of that message with you. So if you are here on Christmas Eve, you're going to hear some of the same. Just the beginning of my message, because I want to use it as a segue into something. We talked about how Messiah came to be a Savior. That was the emphasis. And I told them, and I'm telling you now, I wanted to do more with that topic. Because that is the key to the season. That's the key to why Yeshua, why Jesus came. To save people. But save people from what? Because most people today don't really understand the need for salvation. So I really want to emphasize that this morning. So let me step back, share with you some information that some of you might have heard, and then we'll step and segue into some new stuff. At that time, Emperor Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the Roman Empire. When this first census took place, Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Everyone then went to register himself, each to his own hometown. Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the town of Bethlehem in Judea, the birthplace of King David. Joseph went there because he was a descendant of David. He went to register with Mary, who was promised in marriage to him. She was already pregnant. And while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for her to have her baby. She gave birth to her first son, wrapped him in cloths, and laid him in a manger. There was no room for them to stay in the inn. There were some shepherds in that part of the country who were spending the night in the fields taking care of their flocks. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone over them, and they were terribly afraid. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I'm here with good news for you, which will bring great joy to all people. This very day... In David's town, your Savior was born, Messiah the Lord. Here's the good news. Don't be afraid. I've got great news for all people. Today, the Savior was born. And I'm sure they were thrilled to death. But if you had gotten that news today, a Savior from what? I didn't know I needed to be saved from anything. I thought, you know, I live in America. We don't have war. Everything's good. I got food. I got clothes. Before we talk about that, I want to talk about the shepherds for a moment. Out of all the people the angels could have come to, why shepherds? Probably the most famous of all the Psalms starts out like this. The Lord is my shepherd. This shepherd-sheep metaphor is big in the scriptures. And so that he came to shepherds is pretty cool because on the one hand, the Lord is my shepherd, and on the other hand, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So i got to take a a little rabbit trail here about metaphors in the Bible. Some people think that when a metaphor stands for one thing in the Bible, it must mean that throughout the rest of the Bible, and then they make a mistake in interpreting the Bible. Like, you know, the fig tree. Everybody says, oh, the fig tree stands for Israel. Well, no, not necessarily. A metaphor is localized in Scripture. It might stand for something in one place, but that doesn't mean every time now that thing is mentioned, the same metaphor carries through. I can prove it very very easily for you. The Lord is my shepherd. And yet Yeshua is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So is he a lamb or is he a shepherd? Oh, and then he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So is he a shepherd or is he a lamb or is he a lion? Yes. And all we like sheep have gone astray. So the Lord is a lamb. We're also sheep. You see, if you take a metaphor and try to make it carry through multiple scriptures, you'll really get confused. In fact, you can get lost. Because he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the son of God, the Savior. But Satan is also seen as a lion in the scriptures. So don't take metaphors any further than they intend to be. They just mean one thing in one place at one time. Unless the scriptures give us permission in the other place to extend it. 
So speaking of metaphors, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. The Lord is our shepherd. And Yeshua said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. A shepherd will risk his life for his sheep. So Yeshua came to seek and to save that which was lost. He's the shepherd. We're the sheep. There's the lion. Who's the lion? 1 Peter chapter 5. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So he's the shepherd. His job is to save us from the lion. And we're the sheep. But all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. And so we're these vulnerable sheep out in the mountains. We're just prime targets. We're, we're lion meat. We need to get back into the fold to be safe. And so the shepherd goes about the hills looking for his lost sheep. Remember the parable he gave where he said the shepherd will leave the 99 and go and find the lost sheep, put it on his shoulders, and come home and rejoice. We're the sheep. We're vulnerable. We're weak. We're helpless. We're lost. The devil is the prowling lion looking for one of us lost sheep to devour us. And Jesus is the good shepherd, and he'll lay down his life to save us from the lion. That metaphor, that's how the Bible uses it. It's beautiful. And now you know a little more about metaphor than most people do. Just because a metaphor means one thing in one place doesn't mean that same imagery stands for something somewhere else. Every time the word lion is used in the Bible, it doesn't mean it's a metaphor. Samson killed a lion. That's not representative of him overcoming the devil. He killed a lion. Real man, real lion, dead lion, live man. End of story. No metaphor at all. So just because it's a metaphor in one place doesn't mean it's a metaphor in another place. And if it is, it doesn't mean it's the same metaphor. Bible loves metaphors. I also like metaphors. Listen to this. The Bible also says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins which you formerly walked. Think of the word picture there. Think of the metaphor. You were dead, but you walked. You were the walking dead. Now we have a word for the walking dead today, don't we? They're called zombies. Isn't a zombie something that's kind of alive and kind of dead? They're alive, but they got no soul. Zombies are very popular right now. There's a really popular television show called The Walking Dead, and it's about zombies taking over the world. Now these aren't your old school zombies like you and I grew up with, where they were you know, you're a little ahead on the slides there. These are, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that in a minute. In the old school, zombies were like, somebody died and through black magic they rose from the dead and, they're, and they were called the undead. But the zombies today, like in The Walking Dead, are just people with a disease. And this disease, it, it makes them insane. But worse than insane, they become like impervious to, to most wounds, not all wounds, but most wounds. So they're like dead but alive. There was this show called World War Z, and that's what the other picture was. It's a blockbuster movie. So we got a blockbuster TV series called The Walking Dead, a blockbuster movie called War War, World War Z, and it's all about zombies taking over the world. It's the zombie apocalypse. None of them are magical zombies. They just have a horrible disease kind of like rabies, where it makes them mad, and they want to kill everybody, and they do. They go around eating people. Nice. Let me tell you about these zombies. They can't think. They can't feel. They're mad, driven to attack other people. It's not their fault, but there's no cure. They're violent, heartless, ruthless, destructive, totally insane. Do you know there's drugs that do that to people? There's a drug right now that's popular on the market that makes people's flesh rot off their skin. There's another drug on the market right now that makes people zombies. Headline from last year, 
Miami police shoot, kill man, eating another man's face. This guy was eating another human being because he was on drugs. I think it was bath salts. I'm not sure. So we have diseases like rabies that make us go insane and violent. We've got drugs that make us eat each other. This zombie apocalypse scenario is kind of freaky because it seems almost plausible. I mean, you think about the things these zombies do in these shows, it's not that far removed from what these people are actually doing. So think about it with me for a minute. What if there really was a disease that caused humans to go mad? What if it compelled us to extreme acts of violence and destruction? What if it caused us to hurt people? What if we caught the disease and it started messing with our minds so that we didn't even know we had the disease? What if we were the walking dead? Well, Steve, what do you mean, what if? The Bible just said you are. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, which we formerly walked. Human beings are the walking dead. But if we were really like zombies, well, we'd be destructive and we'd be violent and we'd hurt people almost in an insane way. Our world would be filled, filled with chaos. So I've got a video clip. Let's take a look at it. This woman doesn't know anything about war, so she's doing a little bit of research. And I don't know what the sound is, but it's not necessary. So she's looking at all this image after image after image of war, violence, war, violence. And she starts to shake. And she's just petrified and horrified by what she sees. And run down her face because this is her first introduction. She's some future weird show, but she's first introduced to war and it ends with her seeing a nuclear explosion. Well, the Bible says we're kind of like the walking dead. And the walking dead and all these zombies movies are violent and destructive and insane and just hurting people. Do you know that right now, there are 60 countries involved in wars of some, at some level or another. 60? There's 495 militias or separatist groups active right now. So, Harvard, one of their chief guys, recently came out, it was in the Wall Street Journal and all the major newspapers, just a couple days ago, that right now, we are in one of the most peaceful periods in human history. You know what's going on in Egypt. You know what's going on in Syria. You know what's going on in Iran. You probably know what's going on in China. You know what's going on in Mexico and Colombia. Aren't you glad we're seeing one of the most peaceful times in human history? Let me give you some statistics from the World Health Organization's report on violence. And I'll just quote some of their statistics. The 20th century was one of the most violent periods in human history. More than half the people who lost their lives to conflict throughout the world were civilians. Violence is often seen as an inevitable part of the human condition. Okay, two things. Right now, with these 60 wars going on, we're in one of the most peaceful times in human history, according to this professor. But the 20th century, most violent time in human history, with more deaths than ever before. And this report says violence is often seen as an inevitable part of the human condition. Good thing we don't have a disease that compels us to do crazy things and hurt one another. In surveys from around the world, 10 to 69% of women report being physically assaulted by an intimate male partner at some point in their lives. Upwards of 70% percent. Hundreds of thousands more, hundreds of thousands more are forced into prostitution or subjected to violence in other settings such as schools, workplaces, and healthcare institutions. Some 
57,000 children were killed in just the year 2000, with those aged zero to four years at greatest risk. Many more are victims of non-fatal abuse and neglect. About 20% of women and 5 to 10% of men have suffered sexual abuse as children. In 2000, obviously this is a 2000 report, in 2000, violence among young people left an estimated 199,000 youths dead. For every young person killed, 20 to 40 receive injuries that require hospital treatment. That's on top of the 200,000 that are killed. We may not look like zombies, but we have the disease. It has already spread. Our world is nuts. Do you realize that it's commonplace in this great country of ours? You win a football championship and you're right and destroy half the town. So I'm exaggerating a little because the police keep them from destroying half the town. Why are they trying to destroy half the town? Because they won a game. Let's celebrate by setting people's cars and businesses on fire. We have the disease, people. We are the walking dead. It's not a what if. And I said, what if we were so deep in the disease we didn't even know we had it? It's not a what if. We have it. Remember what the angel said? Don't be afraid. I'm here with good news for you, which will be great joy to all people. This very day in David's town, your Savior was born, Christ the Lord. See, what I just shared with you is horrible news. And that's why the angel had such good news. Christmas is about being saved from the zombie apocalypse. Bet you've never heard that before. That's why Jesus came. To take the walking dead remove the disease from us, and give us eternal life. So that we're no longer the people who celebrate by violence. We're no longer the people who kill wantonly, who have 60 wars going on and say, why, my, it's so peaceful out. Gee, only 200,000 children died this year. How nice. No, we're sick. We're infected. We're broken. Ephesians 2, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to walk. You were dead, past tense, when you walked. Past tense for those who've already been saved by Jesus. Present tense by those who have not yet been saved by Jesus. In which you used to walk when you followed the ways of this world. All of us gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following the desi its desires and thoughts. That's what we did. But because of his great love for us, God made us alive with Messiah. Even when we were dead in our lawlessness, in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So, we were or are the walking dead. And Jesus is the Savior. He is the cure. He said this, and I quote, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I don't know where you all are. Do you understand what I'm saying to be true? Does it resonate with your spirit? And if so, have you come to the Savior? Have you asked him to save you from the disease? And if not, why not? Please join me in prayer. Lord God, thank you for showing us through your word of God that we're sheep lost in the hills needing a Savior. But worse... We're infected, we're walking dead, and we need to be redeemed. And thank you for sending us a Savior. And we celebrate him every day, but especially once a year, when we rejoice at his birth and read the words of the angels to the shepherds, 
I bring you great noise, which, uh, news which will be for all people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior is born, who is Messiah the Lord. And I pray, Lord, that those hearing my voice today would hear your voice, that you would speak life into their souls, that they would no longer be amongst the living dead, but simply amongst the living. For it's in Yeshua's name that we pray. Amen. Could I ask you all to stand with me, please? Washed. 
some people over there. If uh, you're new with us and have not yet been over to the bistro and met any of our leaders, please bring that little blue card over and uh, come on over and say hi and grab some coffee and a bagel and let's just get to know one another a little better. So we're coming on to a new year. So I end this new year with the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Open the new year with the book of Psalms. That'll be my lesson next week and that'll be part of your reading. So you want to read Psalm 1 in addition to your other things this week, and that's the psalm I'll be teaching from next Shabbat. Please bow your heads for the ironic benediction, and you'll be dismissed. Ye Sadonai Panavalecha, Vio Seim Lecha, Shalom. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. God bless you hard. Shabbat Shalom.